Steve, you'll have to just turn this down a little bit. Ephesians 
chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, but it is a gift of God. We are saved by faith by a gift of God. In other words, God made a way for us through Jesus Christ, and in our faith in Jesus Christ, then we are saved in that the salvation of which he has provided for us. But in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, there's a very interesting scripture. 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to preach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. And God may, perhaps, grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. Do you see that? That's very interesting if you think about it. If, what, what Paul's talking about here, is, of course, is elders. Now, it, I don't believe that it totally applies to elders. I believe that it applies to all of us. So, here's the thing. Have you ever witnessed anybody and, and told them about Jesus and you just felt that they were cold or not? able to respond to it or whatever the case may be according to this scripture that without the Holy Spirit giving them the ability to repent they're not going to repent see it's a two-way street we choose God God chooses us and there are people who are in a position of where the Holy Spirit may say it's not their time and so consequently, they will hold back the gospel, or they might have reached a place of where, according to Paul in Romans, of where God says he just turned them over to himself. Remember what C.S. Lewis said? He said that for Christians, God says, or we, as Christians, we say to God, thy will be done. For the world, God says to them, thy will be done. They can do what they want to do, but you and I as Christians can. And this gift of repentance, we have to thank God for the understanding that God chose us at that time so that we could even repent. We think we do so much of this stuff on our own, but it's the power of God's Holy Spirit working and, and drawing us and drawing us closer and closer and showing us the love of Jesus Christ that enables us to repent. If we don't have that love, how can we? Why wouldn't we? It, 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 it's the fact that if we sin and we come to a place of repentance, it's a case of that we're sorry. Why? Because of love. Because I love God and God loves me. And I, I don't repent, nor do you, under the idea that we're going to please God. We do it because we're actually truly sorry by God's Holy Spirit for what we did. There's a difference between saying you're sorry because you were caught and saying you're sorry because you know that you hurt someone that you love. There's a major difference. Well, and so consequently, when we do sin and we come to that repentance in Jesus Christ, it is because He loves us and we love Him. It has to be based on love. It has to be based on God's Holy Spirit working in love. Or otherwise, it's our own work. And it's very plain that it's not by our works that we say, nor by our works do we do any of these things. So in Romans 8, which gives us the fullest view of the work of the Spirit, it started, it starts very simply, if you'll turn to Romans 8 now, with a promise. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. There is conviction of our sins, but there is no condemnation. There's a big difference. And so this is because of what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. It says very plainly, it's for those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and their Savior. So then you get Romans chapter 3 and 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. See, the, the law was unable to save us. The law brought condemnation. Christ does not. 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful his flesh and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh now listen he's talking to you and I in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit we go and we make this concept of walking in the spirit something of which it's not we try to, to see walking in the Spirit as some kind of holiness of which we can obtain or, re, or, or some kind of holiness of which we can do, if you want. It's not that. If I am in the flesh, I am in the flesh. If I'm in the Spirit, I'm in the Spirit. If I am born again, I'm in the Spirit dwells within me, and so automatically how can I be in the flesh if the Spirit dwells within me? If we walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ, we're walking in the Spirit. It's not some great mysticism. It is simply walking in the belief that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And allowing the Holy Spirit to work within our lives. The Holy Spirit not only frees us from the power of sin, but He enables us to live. I'm free. You're free. We've been set free. It is for freedom that Jesus died. To be free of the condemnation of sin. I'm not saying that we can't sin anymore. What I'm saying is we are no longer condemned. We're free. We have been set free by Jesus Christ. And in fact, now when we look at this, what we have to do is it's the idea of Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, of where um, John the Baptist was speaking to the Pharisees, and what he said was, show, he said, the fruit of repentance. What is the fruit of repentance? Is it something that I can do? No. The fruit of repentance is simply the fact of, I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. That's the fruit of it. I accepted Him. He gave to me the fruit of those things of which He has done unto each and every one of us. Flip over to John chapter 17. John chapter 17 in the third verse. John says, And this is eternal life, that you may know the only God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So as according to this scripture in John chapter 17 verse 3, what is eternal life? It's not going to heaven. It is knowing Jesus Christ. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ means that we have the eternal life. Eternal life is not something of which we're going to obtain when we get to heaven. Eternal life is what we walk in right now in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit. We are part of the kingdom of God. We are no longer part of the world, but we are rather a part of the kingdom of God. And as such, we're ambassadors. But you have to understand, we are foreigners. We are aliens in the world. That's the exact word of which scripture speaks of when it tells us this. We are aliens in this world. Why? Because we are filled with God's Holy Spirit. We no longer conform to the ways of the world, but we conform to the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. It's not something we achieve. It's something we are. It's something that God has given us. So it's fellowship with God through Christ is the heart of eternal life. And it is by God's Holy Spirit that we're able to enjoy this fellowship. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14, Paul tells us what God has done. God the Father has delivered us and brought us through Jesus Christ. God's Spirit now resides in us because of what Jesus has done. Do we realize who we are in Romans chapter 8? Look back there, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17a. Uh, I lost it. 
Your Lord. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. How did we become sons of God? By the acceptance of Jesus Christ, right? So, if we're the sons of God, we're led by the Spirit of God. That's, that's the simplicity of it. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now, here's what the problem is. We are the children of God. We have received, according to this scripture, a spirit of adoption. We cry, Abba, Father. Abba is just a term of in German. It means Papa or Daddy or something along that line. It, it gives us the ability to run into the throne room and, and, and climb up on Daddy's knee if you want. He has become our Father legally and in all things. The, Paul and them would have understood this far better because in Rome, one of the things of, because of the Roman law, if somebody adopted somebody, they weren't just by adopted son. They received all the position and authority that went with that family. And when you study the Caesars, quite often one of the things of which happened was that this Caesar's in power and he adopts maybe a nephew or someone of whom he feels would make a better Caesar than his own children. And you see that quite often. That person who is adopted becomes the person who is in charge of everything. You see it over and over again when you study the Caesar's. Paul understood this. All of the people of antiquity understood this. So consequently, when Paul said, you received the spirit of adoption, they understood immediately what it was. It wasn't just as an adopted child that was with the fullness and everything of which that family provided. All of the blessings therein. But we have a little problem. Paul tagged something on the bottom of this of which none of us ever seemed to get past. And I'll admit that when he's writing these things concerning the spirit of adoption, this thing almost seems like it doesn't belong, but as Christians it does belong. Now let's go back to verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, the caveat, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified. Provided we suffer with him. We don't like to look at that idea. Jesus did all the suffering. Where, 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 well, how am I supposed to suffer? Well, here's the thing. That as children of God, those who are alien in the world, we are going to suffer. We are going to suffer persecution. We are going to suffer rejection. We are going to suffer all kinds of things if we're walking in the fullness of Jesus Christ. Okay? All of those things, all of the rejection of which Jesus uh, felt in the world, he said, told the apostles, you feel all of these things also. But they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Now, I, I find it hard in myself to... to draw that line of when somebody gets after me about my Christianity and the way that I am as a Christian and uh, to say, well, you know what, he's not really attacking me personally, he's attacking Christ. He is, I know that, but it still hurts, doesn't it? You know, it's still me, we take those things. But the thing is, is that according to this scripture and according to what Jesus told us, and that's the time we should rejoice because that's one of the proofs that we've really been accepted by him. If they're attacking Christ within us, that's the time to say, praise God, I've been found, and Paul does this on a regular basis, I've been found worthy to suffer for thy name. You're not going to hear this message on a regular basis in our churches in North America anymore because we have bought into this idea that if it's not all perfect, it's not God. But I never wrote this. I didn't write to you saying that all of you have all of the things of which adoption will give you 
You get if you don't suffer, you don't make it. Oh, it doesn't say that. What it says is that we have to suffer. If we share in, share in the sufferings, we'll share in the glory. I think what we should do is take a minute and chase after this rabbit called suffering in order to understand it. <clears throat> Paul tells us that Jesus suffered and that we will do if we follow after him. We do not suffer alone, we suffer with Christ. Understand that. We do not go through any sufferings on our own. We go through them with Jesus Christ. Turn over to 2 Corinthians. I'll put the chapter, and I didn't write the verse, on, and I apologize. Go to Philippians 3.10, that would be a person. Galatians and Philippians 3.10. This is Paul's prayer. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means I may obtain the resurrection of the dead. Paul's prayer was is that he could become like Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Okay? It's talking about Christ. In my flesh I am filled up with what's lacking in Christ's uh, afflictions for the sake of his body that is the church. Paul says that one of the reasons of why he suffers is because of the church. And I think that that's true. We do suffer because of the church. I, as an institution, I believe that we get hurt more in the church than we do in the world sometimes. I wish it wasn't true, but we say mean things to each other. We, we reject one another. We get upset over doctrines of which are not going to get us into heaven and which are, are, should be passed by. We get into little petty arguments. We do all kinds of things, and, uh, and we're hurt within the body of Christ. But truthfully, if I was going to suffer to build up the church, I mean, last week, remember I said all of those little things that really annoy us are the things we should actually, we actually rejoice in because they teach us patience and perseverance and love for others. It's easy to love somebody who's lovable, but only through Jesus Christ can we truly, truly grasp those of whom we have these disagreements only through God's Holy Spirit. Now, here's the simplicity of it. Say that you're halfway through a crisis in your life and you need some counseling and you need somebody who understands and you need somebody who's going to show you compassion. Who do you go to? You go to the one that you know has gone through it. Right? I heard a very interesting thing yesterday. A friend of mine in Red Deer has been extremely sick for a long time, okay? He said to me yesterday when I saw him, he said, I understand what people are talking about when they're seriously ill. He said, I never understood it until I got sick. I always thought, why don't you just call the way up and get on with life? And how many of us are guilty of that thought? But he said, now I understand. Now I have compassion. Now I can relate and care for these people. And this man's not a Christian. The message that he learned, how much more should we learn? How much more should we be able to show that compassion and that love through the power and the anointing of God's Holy Spirit without having gone through that affliction before walking in His Spirit? Jesus did. And if it's Jesus' Spirit who dwells within us, then we should be able to. We should be able to cast out those thoughts and to walk in true understanding of the afflictions and the pain that others go through. 
This is serious stuff. This Christianity is not some kind of game. It is a lifestyle and life changing. And if we're not doing it, what are we doing? Why are we even bothering if we're not allowing to be led by the Spirit and to show this compassion and love before we have to go through it? We suffer for the church. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Second Timothy chapter two, eleven to thirteen. The saying is trustworthy. For if we live with him, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. We did, did we not? Did we not die to ourselves when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Yes, we did. Do we not live now a life in Christ? Yes, we do. So we have died with Christ. Now we live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. For He cannot deny Himself. The truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us in these things. So when we see suffering in the consequence of our relationships with God, our identification with Christ, our witness from Him, and our refusal to conform to the world. That's where we suffer. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It's because we are Christians. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, for this is your spiritual worship. This is the chapter 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and by the testing uh, you may discern what the will of God is, and what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. We learn and grow into those things of which are God. But what is our spiritual worship? Not to be conformed to this world. I, I guess the acid test of all of this is simply this. If the people in the world are really, really like you, you've got to question your Christianity. That's what that's telling me. If we're being totally accepted by the people in the world, then what's separating us from the world? What's making us different? If we're not rejected by them, are we really question Christians? We have to question these things within ourselves. I can't answer for you. But where do you stand in the world today? Are there people who will not talk to you because you're a Christian? Are there people who have rejected you because you're a Christian? If there is, praise God. It means the, the validation of who you are in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Only those who are in the Spirit. You know what the problem with this is? Is that we haven't seen the promise in it. We, we, we've read this as Christians and said, you know what, when I'm in the flesh, I'm not pleasing to God. But, but when I'm in the Spirit, I'm pleasing to God. That's not true. That's not what it's saying. It's, it says that there is a separation between those who are in the Spirit and those who are in the flesh. What's the separation? Jesus Christ and the cross. That's the separation. Those who are in the world cannot please God because they're in the flesh. Those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior walk in the Spirit and we are pleasing to God. Accepted. You walk in the Spirit all the time because the Spirit dwells within you. It's not something that comes and goes. The Spirit of God resides in you. We walk in the fullness of Him. I'm not saying that we can't sin. Don't read me wrong. We can and we do. But as God sees it, we're walking in the fullness of Jesus Christ all the time. 
took me a little while to, to put all this together, okay, and to understand it. Romans chapter 8, is that, verse 18, is that the last one we read? Yes. Okay, Paul says this. For I consider that the seven Romans 8, 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not compared with comparing with the glory that has been revealed to us. Notice what it says. It does not say the glory that will be revealed to us, or when we get to heaven, it says the glory that has been past tense revealed to us. What's the glory that we've seen? And we've all seen it. It's Jesus Christ. It's Him. And in Him, in us. And the Holy Spirit showing us these things. And the fullness of Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. We're getting stronger and stronger and stronger in the spirit. That's what he's telling us. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension. The things of which we go through in this world is preparing us for a weight of glory that we can't even imagine. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things of which are unseen, which is the heaven. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things of which are unseen are eternal. What do we not see? We do not see the Spirit of Jesus Christ living and dwelling in each and every one of us, but we know that that is forever and ever and ever, and this pulpit will be gone. Thus we suffer. Now back to Abba. As a child, we learn to, to love those parents. We learn to learn from them. We learn to love. I, I, I don't know how it works with a child. I know that, that within its mother's womb, you can speak to it, and it knows your voice and recognizes you, and all kinds of things. In fact, I read one time, and, and this was written by a, a doctor, and, and, and it happened to him. This mother was pregnant, and she had a little boy who was about four or five years old. And every day he used to come and sit on his mother's knee and sing to the baby. That's what he wanted to do. Can I sing to the baby? Yeah, you can sing to the baby. Okay. When the baby was born, she was extremely sick, and they didn't think that she was going to make it. And they only allowed the mother and the father in there. And nobody else. And the little boy pleaded and pleaded and pleaded to go into the nursery in the hospital. And finally they allowed him to go in. He came to the bassinet and he started to sing. And she started to respond. And within three months they discharged her. That's the voice she heard. That's the voice she understood. That's true of all fetuses. They know our voices. They understand that. We have been birthed by God. We know the voice of God. He sings to us. We sang that. I glory in God and dance as he sings over me and rejoices over me. I am his. He is mine. I'm in his beloved. He is mine. We have to be like the Shulamite woman who, who in the Psalms of Solomon, Lost her beloved, and I don't understand the songs of Solomon. I don't think anybody else does either, because the, either the, the groom is lost or the bride is lost. It's just going on nonstop. But whenever they find each other, they always have this great rejoicing. And the Shulamite woman found her king and her lover, and she said, And I refuse to let go. That's what we need with Jesus Christ, as the bride of Christ, to refuse to let him go. To proclaim who we are in God because of the spirit of adoption of which he has given each and every one of us. That proves the spirit which produces love in us for God and for each other. We have unity with the body because of the love of the spirit. 
because of Jesus. <laughs> I have really, really good Christian friends, and so do all of you, who then if it wasn't for Jesus, would they be your friend? What do you have in common? I, I, some of them I don't have anything in common. We live different lifestyles. We, we're different people. We have different interests. But yet, you know what? You can get together, we start to talk about Jesus. And there's that unity of the Spirit. We're all one. There's the love of God that, that moves around and about in that. That's why Paul and the apostles were so emphatic about the idea that don't judge anybody by how he looks or what he does. Don't bring the rich man to the front. It's all based on the Spirit. The Spirit is based on the, the unity. It's not what we have. It's who we are. Blood-bought children of Jesus Christ causes us to have fellowship. And that's the basis of it all. We have this unity, one with another. We're all given gifts according to 1 Corinthians 12, 7, and these gifts are given to us for the common good, it says. The things in which we do in ministry are done for the body, not for myself. I was never given anything by God for myself. It's always for others. Always. I was given gifts not so that I could look like I really have a, a, a thing of holiness. I was given gifts, and so were you given gifts so that what? We can build up and edify the body of Jesus Christ. Not for our own use, but for the giving to the body. I'm afraid that we've fallen into a trap, though, of where we, we judge people by the, some of the gifts of which we have, and we say, well, look at how holy that one is, and this one here is not quite so holy. And sometimes, sometimes it is based upon how much they talk. The one who really tells you how oh, he's in love with Jesus and all the rest of it. We say, oh, man, he really loves Jesus. And here's this guy over here, maybe a little bit shy, a little bit introverted. And he's praying for the whole church every day and tears running down his cheeks and we look at him like, what a strange dude. We've got it backwards, people. We walk in the Spirit, each and every one of us, because we belong to the Spirit. We don't go in it, we don't go out of it, we are in the Spirit, plain and simple. My problem with it was simply this. What about sin? If I'm in the Spirit, what happens when I sin? Is that not cause a separation between me and God? According to my scripture in, that we read a couple of seconds ago, it says, it does on my part, but not on God. Though I am faithless, he is faithful. Even in my sin, God does not pull himself back from me. In fact, I think sometimes it's the contrary. I think that he pushes himself more on me to bring me to his place of where I will repent and get right before him through his love. So anyways, here I've sinned. And I've caused this separation. And it's a separation from myself, not on God's part. It's me that separated myself. Okay? God hasn't moved, I have. So, Lord, am I still walking in the Spirit here because I got this sin? Am, am I still in the Spirit? I, I, I'm a blood-bought child, the Spirit of God resides in me, am I still in the Spirit? Well, as a church, normally we'd say no, but you know what, I've come to believe that that's not true either. Because God knows before we ever do anything what we're going to do. He knew before we were ever the world was ever created. He knew the things of which I was going to do. I had free will in those things. I'm not denying that. But God knew the choices I was going to make. Then Paul noticed this very interesting scripture. It says, all things work for good for those who are in Christ Jesus. As a Christian, I have to believe that of all things work for my good, then even my sin has to in some way. Somehow, some way. 
It may cause me to be into a position of where I don't want to be. It may cause me to do things of which I really don't want to do before God, but coming out of the other side of it, it will give me understanding of what it is to be tempted and sin and fall, and it takes away my self-righteousness that I know, because I know I cannot do it on my own. I can only do it through the power of Jesus Christ. You're not going to learn that without sin. You can't. All things... So, we're led by the Spirit, all things working together. That means my sins, my righteousness, my sanctification, my doctrines, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all things work together for my good. What is my good? It, 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 it is to draw me closer and closer to Jesus Christ and to make me more Christ-like by His Holy Spirit. This is what church is all about. This is what being Christian is all about. It is coming to a place of where we become Christ-like. Nothing more, nothing less. In the walking in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit then will give us knowledge and understanding of how to do that. Will we slip and fall? Yes. Will we make mistakes? Yes. Does that mean that we're not in the Spirit? No. If the Spirit of God resides in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It will lead you in all truth and all righteousness. It will cause you to grow in Jesus Christ. That's walking in the Spirit. Let's not make it something it's not. Let's not see it as something that's hot and cold and God gives us and takes away from us. Let us understand who we are in Jesus Christ. We are adopted children filled with God's Holy Spirit and power. We walk in the fullness of Jesus Christ. We walk in the glory of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. So what does this mean? Again, we go back to the idea of antiquity that when Nero or, or the Caesar or whoever it was or any man who was in charge, and this came right up into not that long ago, they had a signet ring or they had a seal, and so they wrote a letter and they poured a little hot wax on there and they put the seal on it. And that seal was the same as their signature. In fact, the seal did not, up till the 1940s, or a little bit better, in China, people used to carry a seal, a stamp, where they would stamp their checks and stamp legal documents and stuff like that. And each one had their own seal. It wasn't a case of putting their signature on the check. It was a seal. The Holy Spirit has sealed each and every one of us, according to the Ephesians. The Holy Spirit has put his stamp upon us. And that stamp represents authority. That stamp represents who we are. That stamp represents who we represent. We. Walk in that fullness of God having said, Here, I will put my mark on you. There, brother and sister, we are Jesus Christ. Now, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and He does. The moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Spirit, our Lord and Savior, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're not, we're not saved. That's simple. And that Holy Spirit causes us to walk where he wants us. We may take little detours, but don't you worry about it. The Spirit's going to bring us back. going to bring us back. Think of him as a really good, holy dog herding a bunch of sheep. We're going to go where the Spirit wants us to go. And we will enter those gates of which he wants us to enter. And God will show us his glory and all of that. If we only accept who we are. What Christ has done for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we worship you this morning.
Lord, each and every one of us have been authenticated. We have authority, we have security, we have ownership and a, and a belief that we are yours and you are ours. And we walk in the freedom of your Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, proclaiming that because we are born again, there is no other way of which we can walk except in your spirit. We can slip into the flesh, O oh Lord, but you do not see it in that way because you always remain faithful to us as long as we believe and as long as we are like the Shulamite woman, well done, or beloved, and refuse to let go. We, O oh Lord, refuse to let go of you this morning and we proclaim that you are our Lord and our Savior and the lover of our souls. Thank you.